Tell me the story about how um, the HCI program uh, was born. I'm, I'm especially interested in um, how decision makers uh, perceived it at, at first. Well, Maryland was a special place because I was able to collect people around me who were sympathetic because we had a kind of institutional infrastructure. And in 1998, I attracted Ben Peterson and Allison Druitt, two younger researchers who did a lot to change our community. And Ben Peterson in computer science and Allison Jewin first in education and then in the College of Information Studies, which has relabeled itself as the iSchool, she became an important uh, player as well. And so that the Human Computer Interaction Lab, by the year 2000, I was able to turn it over to Ben Peterson, who ran it for five years, and then Allison drew it for six years, and now Jen Goldbeck is running it. For me, there's greater satisfaction and a sense of accomplishment to have turned over the lab to somebody else. It wasn't Ben Schneiderman's lab, it was the HCIL. And having just celebrated our 28th symposium, it's very satisfying to see that other people are carrying this forward independent of me. Of course, that gave me the freedom to go on and do other things. Uh, and so that's been my satisfaction, and I'm continuing to work on medical informatics and network analysis. And my fun is to work with my graduate students, writing the next paper, helping them with their dissertations, and working on the next cool and useful idea. Were there any objections to the program or the lab at first? Um, I would say there were no fierce objections, because we had enough of a body of uh, faculty. And of course, as in many things, the students were ahead of the faculty. The students always filled our classes, and there was clearly a demonstrated need. My stud the students in these HCI courses would say, this should be required for all computer science students. Well, that's not happened, but you know we've continued for more than 20 years, I'd say, of having an undergraduate course in HCI, and now in the iSchool, having a variety of courses. And we're shifting into the social media topics and having courses on those topics. So I would say there was some resistance who by people, and I think they would say still, there are those who see this as, well, this is, you know, Ben does good work and he's successful. Uh, you know, but it's not really computer science, okay? The fact that I was elected last year to the board of, uh, to the National Academy of Engineering suddenly shook up some of their expectations because that work was becoming recognized way beyond uh, the boundaries of any university structure. And I think that's a common kind of experience when you're in a environment in a particular university or a company, you're in a sense in competition for the attention of your colleagues. And so um, you know, it's harder to gain that, that kind of support for your work. However, I would say it's not a problem. I mean, we, it's, it's a matter of which resources get allocated, how much we can get. We get not as much as we want, but nobody gets as much as they want. And we get good students, and we have the resources and facilities that we need. Mostly, we are going and getting it ourselves from the National Science Foundation, from companies, and we're very proud of the dozen corporate sponsors who supported uh, our symposium and the half dozen companies who provide more substantial resources for our research. So what do you think that these classes, UX, usability, design, HCI, are not required in computer science schools? I think usability is still a new idea, uh, and the design sense that it requires and the working methods that it entails are quite different from the traditional computer science. And the computer scientists, my colleagues, are very capable people, uh, but they their perception is they're interested in the internet protocols. They're interested in, uh, you know, the, the, the queuing algorithms. They're interested in discrete algorithms. Very important work. Uh, and they see usability as, you know, something 
that's more on the periphery. I might say I'm quite sympathetic in that I too see algorithms as the heart of computer science, and I still get my satisfaction for working on new algorithms that enable better interfaces to get done. And I think contributing to algorithms is an important part of what a computer scientist should do. I tell my students who are working on a PhD that getting a PhD in HCI, in computer science, is twice as hard as the regular dissertation. I mean, you have to do the computer science, I think, and you have to do the HCI. But it's bounded. It's only twice as hard. And so, you know, I've had the satisfaction of seeing students whose dissertation had elements of design or software engineering and also algorithms as well. What would you recommend to people who wish to promote a design or UX research academic program uh, with conservative universities that are sometimes led by technologists? <laughs> yeah. Well, I've helped places promote such programs, and even more exotic ones like Digital Humanities, which is yet a further challenge. Uh, I think there's a growing acceptance and awareness of these things. I think the first major thing uh, is quality of the work that's done. So you need to get really good people, and you have to produce really good work. And then, you know, the doors will open. So you need to demonstrate participation in the major conferences, and I think it helps that we have strong industry support, that there are organizations like Usability Professionals Association, uh, and you know, there's a constant flow of requests, I would say. Every day I get one or two requests from companies that, who want to hire you know, my students. So I think that's an important factor of promoting more prof practitioner, professional-oriented courses. And the research side, the number of journals and conferences uh, you know, continues to grow, and HCI is, in most places, well accepted as a component of computer science. It's in the ACM curriculum, the number of books, the number of students is strong, and, you know, we're growing. We're still growing, okay? It's still a struggle, but the news is pretty good. All right. Um, when I ask UX people who practice user research, what is their biggest challenge? I usually hear how hard it is to engage stakeholders with research. What are your thoughts on this topic? Um, I would say stakeholders in terms of companies uh, yes. research. Um, you know, I see enough success stories that I'm not worried about this. Not every proposal from a usability person is brilliant and deserving. So we shouldn't, you know, assume that everything that's usability related is, is great. Uh, but I think a well-conceived plan and a clear justification that cites examples is very powerful. I really find it very powerful to have the, the book by Randall Bias and Deborah Mayhew called Cost Justifying Usability. Uh, many excellent papers in there. Claire Marie Karat's excellent paper from 1997, which showed you know within IBM that each dollar spent on usability had a hundred dollar payoff in the life cycle of a product. I think those kind of data items are really powerful. In, in gaining acceptance. Uh, some of my memorable satisfactions is coming, being invited to speak at a company about usability, and it was a whole new idea, and, you know, the, I did the pitch, I talked about usability labs and how they could do it. I was very specific, and I described how they should do it. And at the end of the meeting, the manager gets up and he says, okay, I've got $30,000. Who'd like to take us, build a usability lab within six weeks? and run our first test. You know, and that was it. He saw it, he got the idea, he recognized its value, and there it was. Other famous stories here in New York. Uh, I worked with a very capable team at Citibank, which in its early days on 42nd Street and Madison Avenue had a usability test lab, one of the early ones, to test bank machines. And they did a lot of testing. I worked with them and helped also on a 300-page guidelines document to define how the interface for bank machines should go. As a result, Citibank had 50% higher utilization than any other company uh, in the city. And those kind of things are very dramatic when you can put dollars and cents to it and tell a clear story about memorable products, it makes a difference. These days, the cell phones, the smartphones, the iPhones, the iPads are helping build a much wider audience for usability. I think we're seeing it, even in the computer science side, 
by the courses on writing iPad apps. Suddenly, that's become a software engineering course. It's become a major draw for students and contests as they were at Maryland. Ben Peterson ran a contest of mobility apps at Maryland and had 24 teams who began uh, and worked on these projects. And so, it, and it drew a lot of students to various courses. So there's a way where the usability becomes naturally discussed as part of the interface. And I think it's become a cultural phenomenon. It's moved on to my own interest of information visualization, where the New York Times and other sources are doing such interesting visualizations that it's become a cultural phenomenon. And rather than having to push it so hard, again, I get more requests per day of people who believe that an hour spent making a great visualization will save, you know, cure world poverty and hunger. Uh, maybe that's extreme, but, you know, there's high expectations and it's become a cultural phenomena. And I think there are some very nice payoffs, whether it's financial information or medical lab tests. Uh, or other important information that can be presented in more meaningful ways. So we're getting there. We're getting there in a wonderful way where people recognize and appreciate and value usability. I'm hearing from UX practitioners who work in agencies or consultancies as well as um, from self-employed um, uh, practitioners that research is usually the first thing to, to make it out of a design project. Um, and, and this is after the, the client uh, sees a project proposal. Um, how do you think UX researchers can prevent this from happening? Yeah, the term research has a kind of esoteric tone to it in a corporate environment and suggests payoffs that are three to five years away rather than three to five months away. And when times get tough, companies don't have a five-year perspective. They have a five-week perspective. And so... You, usability people have to work on shorter f time frames and they have to produce results uh, and you know not every usability professional has done magic and wonderful things uh, and so you know they will have some struggles but I do think that the uh, notions of very rapid usability testing have been quite accepted the cost is low the time imposition is low and the payoffs are large. I think it's very powerful in the current agile or lean development strategies when you say our first usability test is June 15th and then you have you know three weeks to revise and on July 7th is our second usability test and on July 28th is the third usability test and if you pass that then you could ship but you have to have it set in place in a strong way that you know, the acceptance test and the usability test have power. And it does take a vigorous usability promoter to make those things stick in corporate environments. Uh, there are dangers, we've all seen them, where, oh yes, there's a usability test, there's a usability report, but the pressure to ship is too strong and nothing gets done, or minimal things get done. So those are the things to watch out for, and the usability people have to get onto the schedule and onto the budget at an early stage so that they can be influential in the development process. All right, that's all I had. Thank you very much. <laughs> okay, that was good and easy.